I'm going to take that as a compliment. I don't think he's saying that it's a crazy idea, but we'll see what you think. Um, so, yeah, hi, I'm Simon Worthington. I'm from uh, Bacalyao, which is a project, uh, project of Protocol Labs, um, which you might have heard of if you're familiar with IPFS. Um, Bacalyao is a distributed compute framework, and I'm going to talk a bit about how we distribute our WebAssembly modules that we use uh, to run tasks on Bacalyao. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about Bacalio, but it helps to set the context a bit of why we do things in this way. Um, so I'll just give you a little intro to it really, really fast. Um, essentially, it's based on this realization, I suppose, or this principle, which is that if you're operating at a really massive scale, your centralized systems start to break down. So if you're someone like Uber or Airbnb, where you have a lot of data and it's all moving around all the time, uh, you can't necessarily use the same centralized techniques that everyone else is using all the time because the amount of money and the amount of time and bandwidth it costs to move your data around is prohibitive at that point. And actually, you have to start to embrace more distributed techniques. Um, so when I say scale, I don't just mean volume. I also mean time and distance. So um, for most people in the room, most of your jobs run on planet Earth. Um, back the hour, we run jobs on satellites as well. Um, and actually, protocol labs we build for the future. And so in the future, like, we will want to run jobs on Mars. Uh, and so for that reason, Mars, by the way, I'm a physicist. I'm probably obliged to say that this is not to scale, this diagram. And the other thing I should say is that Mars is like three light minutes away from Earth. So it takes light three minutes to get from Mars to Earth. Quite a lot of latency, not the sort of latency we're used to in Barcelona when we've got 5G. Um, so there's different sorts of challenges. What it means is the back of the hour is designed to run on all sorts of different places. It can run on servers with like four, six, eight GPUs. It's also designed to run on Raspberry Pis and satellites. And lo and behold, WebAssembly is the perfect target for that because you can write it once, run it anywhere. Yeah, OK, great. Um, so let's say that I ask you to run a uh, a WASM blob on the Bacalyao network. And so what I've done is I've taken a program that I've written in Go, and I've linked in this like, huge library to do some statistical analysis on data, and I've created a large WebAssembly blob. And this is super convenient. I can send this blob out to all the Bacalyao nodes, and it, they will run them, I run the code, and return the results to you. Um, and this is super convenient, right? Like, it couldn't be simpler. We've written our WASM once, and now we're running it in all sorts of different places. Um, However, as I've said, in the sort of places that we're talking about, bandwidth is really important. And also, if you're running on a Raspberry Pi, like something that's 100 megabytes might take up the entire memory, or it might take up m most of the cache or the disk space. And if you want to run this job and then run a kind of similar but actually slightly different job, that's a whole new blob you've got to send again. And so the bandwidth and the memory limitations here are significant, and actually also, Maybe you're not running it against four nodes, but you're running it against like 500 or 5,000. And suddenly, if you want to serve that data to someone, you basically need a CDN for that, which you know, some people want to do, some people don't want to do. So there's some, there's some considerations here. Um, we have solutions to this problem already, right? Like if I give you a Python script, I don't give you all the code that you need to run it. I just give you the script, and then I tell you the dependencies. And then if you've got the dependencies, you run it. Or if not, you just go and download them. In WASM, we have a similar kind of situation here. We have modules. So my module can ask for stuff from other modules. It can ex it's expect that in the environment. Um, and this is great, because it means we now, longer, now no longer need to distribute huge lib every time we want to run the same program. We can just distribute smaller programs, and the nodes can dynamically link it and run the WASM. And that's cool, and that works. Um, but there's one catch. Um, if the nodes already have huge lib cached, then that's great. They can just use it. But if they don't, then where are they going to get it from? So for Python, it's simple. You just pip install. And for Ruby, it's gem install and whatever. So clearly, what we need is a centralized WASM module registry, right? No, that's not what we need. Um, registries are great. And again, they're super convenient. Um, but for the sort of places that we're talking about, they don't make a huge amount of sense. Again, Mars is like three light minutes away. So like, if you're going to download a bunch of dependencies, you don't have time to wait for that. 
So instead, what we do on Bacalhau is we make use of peer-to-peer -peer technology, um, the same peer-to-peer -peer technology which, uh, which is underlying IPFS, and to make best use of local data. So we allow, essentially, the nodes to share modules amongst themselves. Um, there's a couple of extra benefits to that. One of them is, well, we're no longer relying on registry SLAs. It also means that if I run code today that is going to use a module, that module is more persistent. So one of the things that we do in particular is distribute science or decentralized science. So if I'm going to write some code today and um, I want to put that in a scientific paper and make sure that the modules and all the stuff that I need to run it are available in the future. And not having to rely on a centralized place means that I get that. Um, so what we do instead is we use content addressing. So instead of asking for huge lib, we actually ask for its, for its content hash. Uh, and we allow nodes, perhaps, you know, these are all nodes running on Raspberry Pis in a forest. We allow them to kind of talk amongst themselves to resolve where the module is. Um, and this is actually kind of how we do it. So obviously, there are a couple of ways you could do this. The one that we're kind of trying out and pioneering at the moment is actually to embed the content hash within the WASM blob itself. So that is some WebAssembly text format stuff up there. And you can see that instead of using a just a random namespace, what I've used is a CID. And so if you give that WASM blob to uh, Bacalhau, it will see that it doesn't, it doesn't have that module. And then it will be able to use IPFS to go and get the module from amongst its local peers, which is an efficient and a bandwidth efficient way of doing things. Um, and what that means is, is that actually you can end up in the situation down below where, yeah, you're asking for just one dependency, but then the dependencies are recursively referencing each other. And so you're able to go and get all of those different dependencies. And this is a self-contained thing. So you can just have, that, have those WASM blobs. They describe all their dependencies and, and where they can be found using IPFS. Or you could use URLs if you want to. Um, and you can build that whole tree. And that, in that way, your whole tree is kind of reference like that. Um, so that's kind of how we do it. It also gives us some extra uh, powers. It means we can do intelligent scheduling. So it means that now we understand what dependencies modules need to run. We can also go and ask our fleet of nodes, who is the best person to run this job? So for example, again, I've got my program. I've referenced it against hugelib. Um, and I can go and say, all right, who has got huge lib already? Who has got huge lib on, on all of its dependencies? Make yourselves known, and you are the right people to run the job. And you can see that node down there, several links down that chain, has got huge lib, and therefore it's the right place to run it. They, none of the other nodes will have to download stuff that way. The other kind of power it gives us is if we have proprietary modules, it allows those modules to self-select on certain jobs. So let's say I have developed the new next generation language learning model, and I've done it in WebAssembly. And now I have a WebAssembly module that I'm going to run against. But it's proprietary. So not everyone's going to have access to this module because it's my IP. I don't know who would do such a thing, but you know, some people like to do that with AI. Um, and, I, and now I can come along, I can allow a user to come along and say, hey, I want to run some code using your language model. Um, and they can give it to Bacalhau. Bacalhau will say, OK, who's got this language model referenced by this WebAssembly module CID? And your, your nodes will say, oh, I have it. I'm going to charge you XYZ to use that. Uh, and then their code will get shipped to you. You can run it safe in the knowledge that you are interacting, their, their code is interacting with yours in a safe environment in a way that your language model doesn't get leaked outside. So it also allows you to do kind of secure and proprietary stuff. And that, in a nutshell, is it. The, the nutshell is we use IPFS to, you, uh, to send out our modules into the world, and we distribute them, and we store the CIDs in the WASM binary, and you, the system can resolve them automatically. That's it. Thanks very much for listening. Any questions? Thank you. Hey, uh, Simon, awesome. Really, really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, so uh, you, I'm not sure if you covered this at the beginning, but can the nodes also be browsers? 
Yeah. Um, in theory, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you could, I mean, like, as long as you can connect your node up to the network, at the moment which it uses a kind of lib P2P system, they're working right now on making it so that you can use lib P2P in a, from a browser context. Then, yeah, your, your code can run there. One of the things we haven't done yet, but that we want to, is compile back the itself into WebAssembly, and then you can run it in the browser, and then you can essentially run both like jobs in the browser as a compute, or you can use, use the client from the browser as well. So in theory, yes. In practice, not today, maybe tomorrow. Sure, yeah, I was just curious about that. And, and with that new capability, would that also be able to uh, work with nodes that are non-browser based? Like you could have sort of a mixture of those two. It, all, it would all be the same to the network, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things is that you in the browser don't have access to very much, but nodes on the network maybe have access to trusted enclaves or GPUs or like, you know, physics simulation cards or whatever, and you can leverage those things from wherever you are. Awesome, thank you. Cool. Hey. Hello. Um, Bacalhau, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong here, but Bacalhau has a Docker mode as well. It does also have a Docker do you, mode. Do you have uh, information about the difference between like literal you know, dollar cost uh, execution uh, con contrasting the two modes, Docker versus WebAssembly? Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, so there's a, there's a kind of well, there's a bullshit answer, to be honest. I'll give you the bullshit answer, which is that it's up to the compute nodes to decide how much they want to charge. Um, so, as, like, back of the hour as the network doesn't set any prices specifically. Um, it's up to those compute providers. Generally, um, our kind of understanding of the pricing structure is based on, yes, a compute time and, like, memory time, or, you know, this amount of memory for this amount of time. Um, it's also based on risk. So, for example, how much risk is there associated with running this job? The risk associated with a Docker job is higher because the security footprint is different to WASM. Um, WASM, obviously, at the moment is inherently kind of like single threaded, and there's lots of work going on in that space to change that. Um, but generally, I think we'd, I'd probably say that like WebAssembly jobs at the moment are cheaper, but you also have to do the work to make your job run in WebAssembly. Like part of the, the interest in Docker is the low entry point. Like you can just take anything and run it in Docker. Um, as WebAssembly, as the ecosystem matures more and more, that cost will go down, and there'll be more uh, parity, I think. One more. Uh, as it relates to IPFS, uh, are there existing tools for kind of mapping or visualizing kind of the availability and access of WebAssembly or Docker code uh, that lives up on the network? Uh, yeah, so there are like search engines that are built on IPFS. Um, there's a bunch of different metadata you can get about what's on the network. Um, I would be careful when using those networks. Like IPFS is a distributed network, which means the content isn't controlled. Um, but the search engines are there to help you find like WASM uh, and also Docker images are on there. Uh, so you can do a like, kind of search, but it's a layer on top of IPFS rather than something built in, if that makes sense. Thanks. Cool. Thanks very much for having me, I guess.